that just everyone knows that Sarah's going to be interning with us this summer. So we're very excited to have her. She passed her very first test of getting the clicker to work today. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, she's she's on she's on she's on the the rock star status because the clicker was not working earlier. So um, just to introduce myself. My name is Christy Bowen. I'm the sales recruiting manager uh, for the Southeast for Gallo. So uh, Alabama is one of, one of our favorite schools that we get to call on, um, and we are here recruiting for our management development program. So uh, that, that's what we do typically when we're here. Today we're actually going to talk to you about some fun different uh, topics, and then we'll go into it in just a second. But I would like my other cohorts to introduce themselves as well. Go ahead. Um, well, we did not plan this, I will tell you that. It just happened oh. to be. Um, it's actually Christmas here, so it's actually, <laughs> we're, actually, we're actually pushing Christmas. <laughs> but my name is Jordan True Love. You might see me from uh, some other career fair um, events, but I'm an Alabama alumni. I am currently the Gallo State Manager for Alabama. Um, graduated here 12 years ago and have been working for the winery and the wine business for 12 years. Um, my name is Ryan Poor. I'm the field marketing manager for Alabama, North Carolina. I do our spirits and liquor division. So New Amsterdam vodka is our, our big thing. Um, I was a student here, graduated December of 12, did the Calamusa training classes and all of the sales program. Um, so I did this stuff and a lot of other stuff here on campus that you guys are going through not too long ago. So, so we'll get started and just kind of talk to you about what we're going to talk about today. Uh oh. Oh, almost, almost. <laughs> so, uh, so before we get started, so who knows anything or knows a little bit about wine? Okay, all right. Who likes wine? Who's been to Wine Wednesday? <laughs> oh, the very good. Of, the rest of your life. <laughs> So yeah, so um, you know what we're going to try to do uh, today is kind of talk to you a little bit and kind of give you enough information to be dangerous, as we call it. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, some basic wine education, so uh, that when you are when you do come into interaction with wine, whether it be in a social setting, whether it be with your parents at dinner, uh, you can kind of have enough information to kind of impress. Um, we're also going to talk about some social etiquette, both um, in the business setting um, and because as um, actually, let, me, let me jump back. How many uh, juniors and seniors do we have in here? Uh, okay, good, majority. So, as you can back up a little bit, as you are juniors and seniors, you are going to be going to those different interviews. Uh, if you, like if you come to work for us, if you come and interview with us, there will be interview situations where you will be um, in a restaurant, you may be at a mixer type situation where you're at you know, a bar establishment. So, you are going to be um, having those type of interactions with, uh, with alcohol. So, kind of talking about the social etiquette, uh, things to do with that. And also some do's and don'ts. Uh, just so that everyone's kind of, if we haven't said it before, uh, this is an opportunity to say it so that you can hear it. Um, and then we'll also jump into just some, some really fun stuff uh, just for general etiquette purposes so that everyone can, we, we can all practice our fun bread and, bread and drink stuff. And then uh, what we added into this presentation, because Lindsay asked us to touch on a few things, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about consumption because we all are, all are going into spring break. And then we're also going to be uh, going into those interview type situations after spring break. Um, and then we just kind of, uh, at the very end, we actually added some things about um, the question that Lindsay actually had about what, what, what goes into the cost of a, of a wine bottle. Like, why are some wine bottles $5 and some are 50 So just kind of give you some information from that. Um, the format's pretty, pretty uh, loose, so if you have a question, feel free to stop this and you know, raise a hand, say, hey, can you talk about that some more? Uh, between the three of us, we will be glad to do that, uh, you know, talk with you. So uh, this is information for you, so feel free. Any questions so far? So first, so this is just to kind of talk, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit of myself when we go through these. So yeah, so we're going to talk about Wine 101, how wine is made, the kind of grapes, where wine is grown, and then regions around the world. Uh, wine and business, the do's and don'ts, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about spirits in a business setting, and then table service. And then last, what, what's the cost of the bottle. So first, Wine 101. So, um, Wine 101, we're going to keep it pretty simple. We're not going to get too much in the weeds because uh, every day I'm still learning about wine. Um, I know I do not know everything about wine, but we're going to try to give you some information, like I said, to be dangerous. Uh, and and my, my cohorts are going to jump in as well. Uh, but, but wine, you can learn about every day. I mean, we have, we have folks who, uh, you know, I've been with the winery for 20 years, and I am learning about wine every single day. I get questions that I may not know the answer to. So if we have a question here today that I don't know the answer to, I will find out and get back with you. So first, what is wine? You know, wine's pretty simple. It's just fermented grape juice. So think about the Welch's that you, you may drink today, but I you had, definitely had that 
Exactly. I was just saying, you know, the Welch's back there, or you had as a kid. I mean, it, it's an agricultural product. It's just simple grape juice. Um, it's natural. So uh, grapes are grown from the vine that are in the vineyards all the way to, to the bottle that you drink. It's a natural product. So with that, it's gonna ha it's gonna be uh, susceptible to you know, things that are natural. Um, about flavor, every wine every wine says something different about its history. Uh, the fancy word for you know the, the soil that the wine is grown in is called is, the fancy word is terroir. So and this is a, this is a Spanish major a uh, Spanish uh, minor girl talking about in French. So I apologize. Um, so, but, but basically all that is just basically the soil and where it's from, you know, depending on where, where in the country that soil is from, it could have lots of chalk, it could have lots of clay, it could be really sandy or, 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 or it could, could be very wet. So depending on where it's grown and where that vine is actually placed, that's going to impart different flavors on the wine. Mm -hmm. there you go. So, so winemaking, so just, just like everything else has a season, so does winemaking. So, uh, so we're actually going to start at the very, uh, kind of like the, uh, the breathing part of the winemaking process or the, of the, the annual season. So we're going to start in winter. And winter is kind of when everyone steps back. So uh, harvest just happened, everyone was running around like crazy. And winter is a time where you can kind of get the opportunity to kind of, kind of, kind of take, take a breath first and foremost for those folks who are actually doing the harvest. But then you actually get the opportunity to kind of uh, just kind of take a look at the vines, and ma uh, make sure that the vineyards are healthy, kind of do a, a little examination to make sure everything's ready for when everything starts to kind of to kind of get going again. Uh, but one one thing you'll hear is they talk about pruning. Um, sometimes people think about pruning is when you're in the bathtub too long and, and your and your fingers get all pruned up. That's not the same thing. So um, pruning in the wine business is basically kind of cutting back the leaves, kind of cutting the dead stuff off, so that 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 uh, that vine is very healthy. So what you'll want to do is if you see some some of the some of the shoots are kind of turned brown or it may have too many leaves to the sun, so it can't breathe and get air, so that those those vineyard managers will go in and kind of and kind of cut all that stuff off, so it kind of makes it, it makes the vine as healthy as it can be. Any questions? And one thing too, in winter, all, all the vineyard, all the vines go to sleep, so it's kind of like everyone's kind of like in, in slow motion mode. Hibernation. Exactly hibernation, because in spring, just like spring here, you, know, you see everything blooming. I, I'm, I'm amazed at all the stuff that's blooming out there. It's beautiful. So that kind of happens the same thing in, in the vineyard too. So you're going to have new buds. You're going to have new flowers. Everything's going to start to come alive in the spring. So that is the and the anticipation of what's to come. In the summer, well, oh, there we go. In the summer, because this is when those uh, flowers, those buds on, on the vines, that's when they start turning into little bitty grapes. And if you've ever seen uh, some pr the grapes in the vineyard, uh, they are really tight and they're uh, they're really small. And if you bit one, you would have a bitter beer face. You would get that. Mm, it's it's not so pleasant. It's nothing like the grapes that are back there. Uh, they're very they're very uh, they're very thick skinned and they're very tight and they're very bitter. So what happens there is in the spring, that's when, that's when the grape starts to form. And then as you keep going through the summer, you get more water and more, and, and, the, and more sugars that are starting to fill, uh, sorry, fill, that was my southern girl coming through, uh, fill, fill that grape and it's gonna start to expand. So, so during the summer is when kind of the magic happens in the vineyard. That's when, that's when those buds and those little grapes actually turn into bunches of grapes. And that's, you know, as you get closer to the end of the summer, that's when the, that's when the vineyard managers and the winemakers, they start getting excited and nervous all at the same time because they can't wait too long to pick the, pick the grapes, but they don't want to pick them too soon. So you'll see them uh, walking, up and down the, walking up and down the vineyards and they're constantly tasting the grapes because they want to make sure it has the right level of sugar to then pick it because as soon as it hits that sugar level, they pick it immediately. And that ends up then going into the harvest. So fall, if you're so, if anyone's an accounting major, this is like the tax season for for, for a winemaker. So this is crazy, crazy time because it is when you have to do it quick. Because so we talked about in the summer, as soon as it hits that level, you pick it and you rush it to the to, you rush it to the winery. There's there's no uh, you know, there's no 50 miles an hour. It's 100 miles an hour to the winery to get it in there because as soon as you pick it, that's when things start changing in the fruit itself. So, uh, so, so the harvest time is when everything kind of it's in full production. You see people in the in the in the, in the vineyards picking either by hand or what we actually have machines that'll pick too, depending how uh, how big the vineyard is. And they put them in big trucks. They take them out out to out to the wineries, and that's when that's when the magic happens. Actually, in the winery, is the crush starts to happen. So, yeah. so this is how we get to this part. So. You've got red grapes and you've got white grapes, right? So 
the process is very, is very similar, but there's some major differences between how you treat white grapes when they hit the winery and then how you treat red grapes when, you, when they hit the winery. So let's talk about the white grapes. So the first thing, the white grapes. So a big truckload of white grapes comes in, into the winery. They dump them into like the, the uh, what's it called? The hopper. The hopper. No, thank you very much. Um, and then basically what they have, they are pressed. So uh, we, this is a, you can see a little small version of that. But they have these long cylinder, uh, you know, uh, stainless steel tanks. And they, and they put the grapes in there. And then inside those is what they call a bladder press. And basically it's like a big balloon. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then as the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's pressing, just gently pressing against those grapes. Because with, with the white grapes, you, you, want, you want the wine just to flow. You want the grape juice just to flow. Uh, so you don't, want, you don't want any of the seeds or any of the skins or any of the stems that are in all that to kind of get into the wine. So they gently press it so it runs down. Uh, then it's going to go into uh, a ferment. Uh, it's going to go to the ferment phase. Uh, where it's actually going to be in a stainless steel uh, container or huge vat or in a wood barrel. So depending on what you want to do, what the winemaker decides to do, uh, for stainless steel, uh, that's going to be more for your wines that have, don't have any, um, or have more fruit forward taste, like a Sauvignon Blanc or a Pinot Grigio. Um, anything like a Chardonnay, where you want like that barrel influence, that's when you'll decide to put it into a barrel. So those are two different ways that you can kind of hold and, uh, and ferment uh, for, oh sorry, not, not yes, yeah, sorry, and, and, and ferment for that white wine. And then you'll go through the clarifying because when wine comes out, it kind of looks kind of cloudy and you see you've got kind of all kinds of stuff going through it. And no one wants to put that in a glass and kind of go, mm, yummy with some things floating in it, right? But like when you, have a, when you have a glass of Pinot Grigio or Chardonnay, it's clear, right? You can see through it. It's brilliant. Light bounces off of it. Well, it has to go through a clarifying process and that kind of gets all the gook out of it. And then, and then you can age it so again if you want to. And then you can blend it if you want to blend it for, for, you know, with different vineyards. And then it finally goes to the bottom. Jumping into the red cycle, so there's a little difference here. So, so if you, if you see here, the very first thing in the red cycle is crush it. So basically, you're going to put in stems, and we're going to have a chance to try this in a second. Stems and seeds and uh, the skins all in together it makes it really kind of, if you look at it, kind of a gross mush of stuff. And you're going to you're going to put it in there and you put it all together. You don't you don't care what happens after that. And then it's going to go into to the ferment to fer fermenting stage. So we're actually fermenting the grapes with all that stuff still on it. Whereas in the white, we didn't want any of that stuff on it, right? So for the red, we keep all that stuff on it, and that's fine because it's going to impart some flavors that we kind of want to have um, on the wine. And oh, bless you. And then, and then the uh, the back half of the red wine process is very similar to the white, but it's that front end process of the red that makes it so different from the white. So we'll kind of jump into that in just a little bit later on too. Any questions? That was kind of. So if you ever heard anybody say like a buttery Chardonnay, yeah, it's a new American oak barrel. So brand new barrels. So like bourbon is charred, usually already charred barrels. They don't get as much as vanilla. American oak, very vanilla. So you're gonna have Chardonnays that taste like a big stick of butter or like a big vanilla bomb. Those are probably brand new uh, American oak barrels that, which you get like the buttery Chardonnay. Where red, you're not gonna get any. They're not using brand new vanilla or brand new American oak barrels. Um, so what about blush? Blush, we're actually going to get to that. So I have a slide just for that. So we'll get to, and we have an experiment we're going to do. So hold on, Tyler. Um, so is it, I'm going to hold that. I'll get to you. Thank you. Just making props over there. So, so the crush. So the, it's a very good segue because this is my little slide. So, uh, so the crush. So after the grapes are picked, they're sent to the winery. They're crushed, they're pressed, or release the juices. So, um, just like we talked about reds keep their skin and seeds on during the crush to get the color and the flavor. White wines are pressed their juice just to get the juice, right? So anybody have an idea of what color all grape juice is? White. I heard, I heard it white or clear? Yeah, so it is. So um, so yes, if, if my handy dandy assistance here, um, where, where was the paper towel? Okay. Oh, okay. So, so we have a fun experiment just to kind of show that, and I can hand it out to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that. We, we did not it. practice this part before. So. Yeah. Yeah. Take, it, take a grape. Yeah, These are it. the world's largest grapes, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they are. But they were on sale at And don't eat them because they have seeds in them. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you like seeds. This so you don't get on your clothes. Yeah. 
If you don't have a plate yet, take a plate. I'm sorry? Yes. Sarah, we'll do it like church. Take a great pass it down. Okay. So, yeah, so, so we're going to do a fun little experiment. So, yeah, so you don't need grapes on your clothes. You can totally use the, uh, use the plate. It's you know, we're not making any. Oh, yeah, you don't have to eat it, but I'm going to tell you a few things about this. Take so. one, pass it down. So, um, so as you get your uh, paper Sarah. towel and as you get your grape. Wait. Everybody back there? Can you take the bowl and pass it back? Yeah. Okay. As you get that, so um, so so for those of you that have it, and when you guys get yours in the back, if you guys want to take a fingernail or a pencil or something and kind of prick it just to kind of break the skin. I'm gonna grab one too, so I can show you guys one. Is there any more grapes? Oh yes. Can you grab me one, sir? Can you grab me a grape? <laughs> yeah. I'll, 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 take, I'll pick one so I can show you guys what I'm doing. They're large, so everyone can see them. So yeah. So if you guys want to take. Yeah, they're huge. Take it and squeeze it like this. Get a little gentle squeeze. Do not, do not squeeze and hit your, hit your uh, neighbor. So you can kind of squeeze it. So yeah, so yeah. So you see that? And I know this is so. So so what? What color? And you can see through it. It's what? It's clear, right? So grape juice is clear, but this is a red grape, right? Hmm. So how do we get that color? Back to your question. So next up, what I, what I want you to do, and sorry, we're getting kind of down and dirty here with all of our grape stuff. <laughs> um, I want you to take a piece of the grape. I want you to see if you can peel back. Just peel back a little piece like this. And then I want you to take it on here. Sorry, I'm trying not to get it. I mean, it might be kind of hard to do since you don't have a hard surface. But what I want you to do is take 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 the grape uh, the um, the skin. And take this and then go against it. And it should be, you should get some red coming on there. Oh, you can see. You can see right here. here. Yeah, my, my paper towels are too good of quality, I think. But you should be able to and then, do that. Let's see. There we go. There we go. So you see the red that comes out? If you take, take the skin, you can write your name, you can do whatever you want to. But you see that red? So that stain, right? So, so there's stain in this color, right? So, back to, back to what we talked about. So white wines, they don't have any exposure to any of those parts, we, to, to the skin. So white wine, it takes it, squeezes the juice just like we did the very first part, and that's all that happens in white wine. Well, in red wine, the skin is left to touch that, that, that grape juice. So if, uh, if you have something clear, so think about if you have a, a, a laundry load of whites. And somebody puts in a bright red shirt, and then you wash it on some warm or hot hot water, and then what happens to that load? Okay. It turns pink, right? So the same thing happens to get blush, but to get blush wine. Basically, it's only it's only had exposure to the skin for a little bit, whereas like a Cabernet or a Merlot or red or true red wines, they have a very long contact with, with that clear juice. So there's that, basically the color that's in the wine, it kind of shows you how long the skins were in contact with that juice. So just think about that. So, so I would call it, you know, a, a, I call it like a, a, a blush kind of half, half done and a Cabernet being full done for, for, for full time in, in contact with that juice. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So but before we go forward, I want you guys, just for one more thing with our fun grape here. If you guys will take a seed, and kind of see if you can get a seed out of there. And kind of, if you can, kind of bite it. It tastes terrible. Yeah, it does. It does taste terrible. <laughs> yeah. So you got that. So we're doing some fun stuff here. So that bitterness, that that kind of pucker that you just had, that's what they call a tannin. So when you hear people talking about red wines and tannins, so because red wines have skins, they have seeds, and they have the stems that are from that great that great cluster. <coughs> that are in contact with that juice. So if you have a red wine and it kind of goes, kind of get that pucker factor, that's exactly where that's coming from, is that exposure to that, tan that tannic seed that was, or stem that was in the juice. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we've had fun with grapes. So have you ever had anybody say, I need tannin-free wine, or I'm allergic to tannins, or tannins give me hangovers? They're saying that that tiny little seed is what is causing their headache. Not the bottle of wine, <laughs> or the two bottles they or had. Or the two bottles of wine, exactly. but that tiny. That. That, so people will say, "Oh, I have tannin-free wine." They have tannin-reduced wine, where they try to get as many of the seeds out as possible. But there's pretty impossible to have tannin-free wine. Yes. I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that now they have a filter that you can buy when you drink wine that will filter out. 
Yeah. It'll filter it out so you don't have like a hangover the next day. What the sulfates have a lot to do with hangovers too. So okay. and sulfates occur naturally. Uh, they have well, they have some wines that are no sulfates added, <laughs> but sulfates are going to occur naturally in the wine making in your in grapes in, in the process. So they're already kind of in there. Um, some people that have that can't drink it because of the sulfates because they're allergic to them. So just yeah. tell them to take a Benadryl or a Sudafed and they'll be fine. <laughs> Granted, not going to mix the two together, but, but it, 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 does, it does help. help kind of, so any questions? Any questions about you know uh, the color of grape juice? How how um, how the how the you know the wine gets different colors? So basically, you have clear, you have white, you have you have blush, and then you have red, and then variations obviously on that spectrum. Any questions? Oh yes, yeah. and you can eat the grape if you'd like to. So after you pretty much cut into eights. <laughs> So fermentation. So, 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 so this is a, this is a you know the fermentation process. You know, grape juice is poured into stainless steel tanks where winemakers add yeast. So basically, all wine is is taking that Welch's grape juice that you knew as a kid or you may still love today, and taking that sugar and the yeast converts it to alcohol, and that's all that happens. So yeast, if you've ever seen a yeast, it kind of looks like a little. I don't know, it's, it's not a very cute thing, but it, it's it's, nat it's in all the food, it, it's naturally occurring in nature. Uh, but but yeast eat sugar, and then they produce alcohol. So basically, in that in that format, you're, when they're eating the sugar because it tastes good, and they ended that process, alcohol, the sugar is converted to alcohol. So that that's where all that happens is in the fermentation process. So that's when fermentation is when grape juice becomes wine because of that of that of that biological process. Any questions? So aging, so you know this is the funny part. Aging causes wrinkles. Yes, it, it does, but but not not in wine and me. Uh, but but uh, but aging basically kind of kind of lets lets different things come out in the wine. So uh, if things are aged in a stainless steel tank, there's not going to be a whole lot that's imparted on that wine itself. So that that wine is going to stay like for a Sauvignon Blanc to keep it very fruit forward. You put it in a stainless steel tank, and it's going to basically like you know just kind of mull and keep that nice fruit forward taste. But if you age it in a barrel, so you've got you've got a wood barrel, so that wood is going to impart some of the wood characteristics in on the wine that it's interacting with. You, if you look at the surface area of a, of a barrel, you've got a lot of surface area on the inside that, that wine is interacting with, and then you have a little bit of oxygen flowing back and forth as well. So it causes some very chemical changes inside the barrel, and that will impart different flavors into the wine that's in that barrel. Um, and then bottling. Obviously, we couldn't drink it very well if it wasn't in a bottle. So, uh, so that that's when this one after aging, we throw it into some bottles, and that's how you buy it off the store shelves. Any questions? Okay. So we're gonna have a little fun here, fun with words. So, uh, so kinds of grapes. So we have whites on one side and reds on the others, and uh, so we have the pronunciations next to them. So we'll kind of have some fun as a group. And I know there's some folks that are still working here, so we'll kind of <laughs> quietly all say them together. But you can repeat after me because. Sometimes if you look at these, you're like, there's no way. I remember I saw a Gewurztraminer the first time I ever saw it, and I'm like, there's no way. I'm German, and I'm like, there's no way I can put all those contents together and make something. So, so let's just walk through, let's walk through the whites, and we'll just kind of, you know, I'll say them, you can repeat after me, and then you can kind of feel comfortable when you do see them, or you can impress your parents when you're ordering at a, at a wine, at a wine at a table, and kind of go from there. So, the first one is Albarino. I'll say it together now. Albarino. Um, and the next one, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Grigio. or Pinot Gris, as it's sometimes called. Pinot Gris. Okay. And then we got Riesling, Riesling. Okay. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Uh, Gewurztraminer. Gewurztraminer. <laughs> and there's some good strong German folks that can say it a lot better than me. And this is a Vignet. Vignet. And then you have Chardonnay. Which is Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Okay. So then we jump over to the Reds, and we've got Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, uh, Merlot. Merlot. And then San Giovese. San Giovese. <laughs> uh, Tempranillo. Tempranillo. Uh, Malbec. Malbec. Uh, Syrah. Syrah. And if you're if you're Australian, you say Shiraz. You say Shiraz. <laughs> uh, um, and then, or you can say Shiraz. It's Jordan is. Um, and then you've got Zinfandel. Zinfandel. And then Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, you'll be so impressive. Your parents are like, this is good stuff. <laughs> you, can, you can totally just drop those anytime you guys are out ordering some wine and just have some fun with them. So, any questions on these? 
Here's some of the more popular wines. Granted, there's more wines on here that I can list that you may not see on a regular basis, but this is what you'll see if you open up um, any type of you know, menu uh, for, for the restaurants that you guys are floating through. This, they, they'll pretty much cover the majority of those at least. You guys all got Moscato down, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that, 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 that on here. The Scotto. We'll have to add that on here. I did, that one just totally slipped by me. So just to kind of give you guys, um, we won't walk through all of these. Um, and if you need these, uh, Lindsay's got copies. If, if you guys want to have these for flavor profiles, I'm sure she can get those to you. Um, but you know, these are just some things that you can think about because a lot of times you see a wine, you see a wine, you're like, okay, well, what does that taste like? But this will kind of give you just a, a little bit of stuff to kind of go on. So Abarino, this is from Spain. It's pretty light. But you, when you think about it, think of a bowl of uh, sliced peaches. So it's light, refreshing. It, 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 you know, it, it's not going to be very heavy. A Pinot Grigio or a Pinot Gris, as it sometimes is called. Um, easy, approachable. Um, it's like a cool patch of shade in a hot summer day. So it's very refreshing if you think about it. Is there a difference in a Pinot Grigio and a Pinot Gris? I don't know, Ryan. Why don't you tell me? That's why I asked. Oh, no, no. I saw spirits. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they're, they're kind of like cousins, just like Syrah and Shiraz are cousins, um, depending on where they're grown. Uh, you can have Pinot Grigio, typically it's going to be your Italian. Uh, Pinot Gris, but well, we have Pinot Gris out of California as well. So um, they're, they're very similar. It may just be where, where they're originated from. So. Same grape, it's just again. Yeah. yeah. Same grape. Body body questions. Body. Just, just very close cousins. <laughs> very close cousins. Um, a Riesling, light and breezy, um, you know, a scent of spice. So if you think of a Riesling, uh, they, they, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the most famous Rieslings are actually grown in Germany uh, because it's, it's a very hearty type of grape. So I think it has a, it's light and breezy, but it's got a little spice attribute to it. A Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I mean, this says just cut grass, honeydew, and melon. So those are two pretty different tastes, right? You think grass and you think melon. Depending on where you're buying your uh, Sauvignon Blanc from, if it's from California, it's going to have more of that cut grass type, type of flavor or type of sensation. If you're, uh, if you're getting it from New Zealand in the Marlboro region, that's going to be the honeydew and the melon you're gonna, or a grapefruit even. You're going to get a lot of fruit. So the very different type, two different types of the same grape depending on where they're grown. Uh, Gewürztraminer, a tea cafe. So it's got a little nut to it and a hint of spice. So again, it's one of those German varietals that you typically see. So it's going to be a little different, a little surprise than a bottle of a beignet, full aromatic. So think of a bouquet of flowers. So when you smell it, you're going to get a lot of like great sensations, but it's going to be very light and floral. And then Chardonnay. This one kind of goes the gamut. So you can cut. It says a good friend, balanced and consistent. You can have a buttery Chardonnay. You can have you know an, an appley Chardonnay. It's, it's very, it's very. You can get different different types of Chardonnay. Uh, but Chardonnay is probably one of the most popular white wines around. So it, it's pretty easy to drink. Any questions on this one? What's your favorite? You know what? I am typically a red girl, but I have jumped back over to, to New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs as my new favorite. So, so good stuff. I think I might be having one tonight, actually. <laughs> but back to these are our range in light to heavy. So when you think of white wines, Aberino is going to be your lighter version, and Chardonnay is going to be your heavy in the white area. So white typically is going to be lighter all in general, but it's it just the heavier of the whites. So same thing with the, uh, okay, with the reds. Light to heavy. The Pinot Noir is going to be your lightest of your red wines, where your Cabernet is going to be your heaviest. So just to kind of look at this Pinot Noir, it's, uh, it's light. It has, a, it has some fruit on it. Think of cherries. Um, so they call it artwork in a bottle. So just kind of think about that, how that might dance in your head. Um, Merlot, lush and easy on the palate. It's your favorite. You like to hang out with it. Merlot is very approachable, very easy to drink. Um, and if you guys know, uh, you know Sideways, if it's a movie all about Merlot. So. It's a great movie. It's on Netflix. <laughs> it's all about yeah, I was like, okay, deal. Okay. Um, uh, uh, San Giovese. Um, you know, if you if you ever had a Chianti, uh, you know that's that's what that, that's what that's what's in that bottle is, is San Giovese grape. So think think about your favorite Italian opera singer. So to help help you remember it's Italian. Uh, Tempranillo, uh, full-bodied red wines. It kind of had lots of berry. So uh, it's from it's from Spain. So think about your favorite flamingo dancer when you're thinking about Tempranillo. A uh, Malbec, which is one of my personal faves, in case Ryan was going to ask me. Um, it's ripe and plummy, and the best ones are from Argentina. So again, sophisticated brunette with a silk scarf. So just to kind of you know, personify some of these grapes, uh, these are some fun things we put together. Uh, uh, Syrah, it's got peppery with dark berry notes. So if you like a little spice, uh, this would be a great one to start out with. Um, it's the urban hipster, if you will. 
Um, the Zinfandel, this has got a lot of spice to it. So if you like a lot of bang, a lot of spice and pepper, Zinfandel is, is where you're going to want to go. And again, it's on that heavier spectrum of the red wines. And then last but not least, the granddaddy of them all uh, would be Cabernet. Big, bold, distinctive. So, uh, you know, this is a cool, a cool older guy in a tailor to see. <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe it's it's not old. <laughs> 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 so, so you just have some fun to kind of think about, you know, to kind of personify some of these grapes, to kind of take or demystify some of the grapes uh, for you. So this is some fun stuff we put together just so you can kind of, kind of take out some of that, you know, the pretentiousness, if you will. So, so how many people here thought Merlot was a really heavy, like, wine? Like, as far as, like, a Cabernet? Cause most people think Merlot is, like, a really rich, really heavy, like, yeah. Cabernet-esque wine. And it's, it's pretty light oh. as far as... See? Yeah, and now she knows. As, as, far as, <laughs> as far as reds go. Uh, one thing I wanted to add, and she was sitting here talking about either listed from lightest to heaviest, not just in flavor profile, but really body. So when you when we get to the menu part, for example, when you're at a restaurant and you see a lot of, even if, up here, full-bodied, when we're talking about body, you're talking about the difference between drinking skim milk and drinking whole milk. Mm -hmm. So a Pinot Noir is going to have more of that mouth feel when you take a sip. It's going to feel like skim milk. So you know the difference if someone handed you a, a glass of skim milk and had a glass of whole milk and the way that body of uh, the milk tastes in your mouth or feels in your mouth, that's when we're talking about body feel. And then we also talk about light to heavy when we're talking about the, the, the flavor characteristics as well. But when you're looking at a menu and you see something like full bodied or light bodied, just remember that's how it's going to feel when it hits your mouth. Um, and just think about the different, you know, skim, 2%, whole milk, yeah, almond milk, whatever. All the different types of just milk because of how the consistency of it and the, the thickness and lightness of it. Absolutely, and, and, and also think about how that pairs with food. So if you have a big, bold wine, you know, if, if, if I told you I wanted a big, bold dinner, you know, what, what, kind, what kind of things what would you suggest to me? If I wanted something big and bold, is the great steak. dinner. Exactly, a big, fat steak. So Cabernet goes great with big fat steak. So, so just think about that. So, you know, the way the way the wines that the, you know the way the wines were described, they also would pair well with the foods that are kind of following those same descriptions. Any questions? Okay. All right. So, getting back to what what doesn't fall necessarily in white or red, you have these guys. So we've got rosé. So who 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 is in love with rosé these days? Uh, you know, oh, rosé is delicious, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if I'd asked that question like two years ago, I don't think I don't think anyone would have been going to it because rosés have just come into popularity. It used to be red blends before that was moscatos. Now rosés are like the new hot trend, and so we're very excited about that. Um, so ros and you say it rosé, just in case you wanted to know that. Um, dry, light, and refreshing. Well then, but if you look at its uh, its, its familiar, you know, not so uh, I guess distant cousin because it is in the pink family. If you look at a white Zinfandel, who who's ever had white Zinfandel? Whose okay. grandmother has had white Zinfandel? Exactly. <laughs> I was like, I wasn't expecting any answer. Everybody. Up, I was like, no one drinks white Zinfandel. Back in the day, white Zinfandel was the, was the blush. But if you had a rosé in one hand and a white Zinfandel in the other, and you expected to get the same tasting wine, you'd be uh, you'd be very disappointed because they're completely different. That that white Zinfandel is going to be sweet. I, I think strawberry when I think white Zinfandel. So. So you've got two different wines in the glass. They may look very similar, but you put it, you put them on your palate, and you're going to be like, "Whoa, one's going to be pleasurable, and one's not, depending on where your taste profile goes." Right? It's the like original sweet, Moscato. You know, I'm sorry. It's like the original Moscato. Yes, exactly. It was, it, it, it was. It was. It was the. It was the. You know, it was before the Moscato ever yeah. came around. So, um, and then uh, then sparkling. So, sparkling. You know, everyone. Everyone, I'm sure, has heard of Andre, Barefoot uh, Bubbly, maybe. Mm -hmm. Lamarca. Lamarca. So all those have a little bit of fizz to them, right? A little bubbly effervescence. They all fall in that sparkling category. So, uh, so they're they're going to have the bubbles. Any questions? Okay. I'm not pointing right to here. So then, this is the fun stuff. So you hear all these wine critics, or you'll hear you know, different descriptors, or you know wherever people are talking about wine. So you'll hear the what the experts say, and then what the real what, what they're actually trying to say to the rest of us. Um, so if you hear us talk about mouthfeel, that's basically like, like Jordan was talking about the, how it feels in your mouth. Like uh, 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 skim milk is going to feel a lot different in your mouth than like a, a good, heavy, full vitamin D milk, right? It's going to be heavier. So the way it feels in your mouth, just think about that example. You've got, you know, you got uh, skim milk or fat-free, you've got 2% and, uh, and then full uh, vitamin D. So how that feels and the weight of it and kind of how it rolls around your mouth, that's basically all they're saying when they say mouthfeel. Uh, 
fruit forward, I think I've been guilty, I just said this a few minutes ago, it basically means fruity. So if it's a fruit forward wine, you're going to get a lot of the fruit characteristics of that wine instead of some of the other stuff that may come from like the barrel or what, what are there other aging components that it went through. Um, harmonious, this is my favorite. I'm like, whoever says harmonious, no. Um, basically balance means it means you're not it, it's pleasant in your mouth that's not going to be too much too much of one thing or too much of the other it kind of just feels very pleasant in your mouth or it tastes very pleasant like it's not going to be too much of one thing just balance a uh, tannic we just had that so when you bit into that seed that that's that's tannin so when you that's tannic and that's exactly what that means uh, the tangy mouth drying feel so kind of when you bit that seed it, everything kind of got really dry on your on the tip of your tongue that's exactly what that tannin is. Um, robust, we kind of talked about that, bigger rich. Dusty, I don't hear dusty very often, to be honest with you. Earthy, um, if you think if you've ever, I mean, if you've ever, ever um, been a kid and licked some, licked some dirt, you know, have that kind of taste that's just gross. Um, not gross, but it, it's very, like, dry. That's what earthy's going to taste like. If you've ever, like, been in, in, like, in a dusty area and kind of felt like you've tasted the dust as you've walked through, that's that earthy coming, that's the earthy sensation or earthy smell or earthy taste. On um, then peppery, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of pepper too, it's got a zinc to it. So just kind of taking some of the foo foo words out and kind of making them kind of more mainstream. Any questions about those? Okay. All right, so we're, so just want to, we just want to kind of walk you through this um, real quickly, like where, where are most of the, you know, wine grown? Where's where are most of the best selling wine grown? Obviously we have here in the USA, uh, but we also, you know, what great wine is also grown in Chile, in Argentina. You've got all over Europe, that, that would be what we call the old world. Um, and then you've got down to South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. So the, if you look across there, uh, the really cool thing to look at is, is you look, look at the latitudes of the U.S. and Europe, and then look at the latitudes of, of, of the southernmost countries in, in, uh, on, the, on the southern, southern end of the, of the um, world. They're all in the same latitude. So just think about that. So when you're looking at the map, you kind of say, oh, these are the grape growing regions and they're all in the, all in the same areas of, you know, around the globe. Any questions? Is, wait, oh, what, oh, oh, yes, sir. What is Canada? Canada's not in there. It's just not one of the main growing ones. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to make, I mean, there's, I mean well, there's all kinds of places. You can grow wine anywhere. Um, just, you know, Canadian wine necessarily is not necessarily one of the most popular. So we just kind of kind of stick with, with the most popular. So yeah, you can grow wine anywhere, but because of the temperatures up in there, you get really high, and they have some, some really harsh winters. It's kind of hard to grow a, a, lot, a lot of the vegetation up there. Did you have a question? Oh, it was the same question. Okay. We may have to get some <laughs> I, I haven't asked that question. So has anyone taken the chance to look at a wine label? I mean, we, I mean, in the grocery store, they're all staring at you. I think you know, thousands of them are looking at you, and they can be very overwhelming. Um, so, um, the, and the, depending on what type of wine you're looking at, if you're looking at a New World, which is from the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, um, Argentina, or Chile, those are considered New World wines. Or if you're looking at an Old World wine. So when you think about Old World, where did wine originally start getting its popularity? Back in Europe. So that you think Old World, you think about the, whole, the, the European areas. Um, if you're looking at a European or an Old World label, it's going to have a ton of information on there. And it's also going to be uh, telling you where more about where the wine was grown. Um, this is a New World label, and this is going to give you th th these little tidbits of information. It's going to be a little bit less less cluttered. An Old World label has got a lot more information on it. Uh, the New World said we're, we're going to keep it simple. Um, so you'll see the name typically at the very top, and this is one of our brands, Louis Martini. The appellation. Basically, where it's grown. So, if it's in, if it's in Napa Valley, that means it's not just California. Those grapes came from that one area of California, the Napa Valley area. Um, the the varietal type, which is the kind of grape it is, it's in the bottle. Uh, the vintage, which means basically the, the year the wine was made, and then uh, also have the alcohol content somewhere. So, in, in case you're curious, it, it's normally very small, but it's right there. On the so, so, so those are some tidbits you can get from the label. And if you look at the back label, has anyone ever read the back of a label? Awesome, great, awesome information because you can find out a lot of information back there. You can find out, you know, what what the winemaker was kind of hoping that the wine tasted like. It'll tell you this wine you'll, you'll be able to get these characteristics out of. Sometimes they'll have uh, food and wine pairings on the back there too. So you can totally cheat by looking in the back. So if, you, if, you're, if you're in Publix and you're looking, you're like, I see that, but I have no idea what it tastes like. 
flip that bottle around, let's kind of take a look at it and just see, because a lot of times they'll tell you either what the wine should, they're hoping it tastes like to you, and then also the, the food pairings, because that, that'll help you kind of figure out, you know, this one is for me or not. Any questions? All right. So we kind of walked you through wine 101, kind of all the stuff about wine. We put, gave you a ton of information about wine. Any questions before about wine in general before we go into some of the do's and don'ts and fun tips? Oh, yes, sir. I think we understand the, what you talked about in the yeast. Do you put the yeast in the uh, grape juice and let it um, do we add the yeast? Do, you, do, you do we add yeast, or is yeast uh, naturally occurring? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So there, there's yeast on the outsides of the grapes that's naturally occurring, and depending on what the winemaker is trying to do, they may, may add a certain strain that may. Um, I don't know on my on my yeast um, stuff, but they, they have different they have different strains of yeast that do different things. They may they, they, they may turn the alpha, they may turn the sugars in quick more quickly. Uh, depending on what 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 the winemaker is actually trying to do, it's almost like an art. Uh, that they can add some of the yeast to, to get a certain a certain um, a certain uh, uh, a development in that fermentation process, but there's already yeast on that grape, um, it, so it's on the skins. Typically, it's not enough to kill. Yeah, skin. yeah. So they have to kill the yeah. part. So. Well, if it's on the skin, what happens with the white wine? I thought, yeah, he took the skin off the. the yeah, so so, the, so they'll have to add some of the white wine. I, I thought you were talking about red wine specifically. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, both. Yeah, so they'll have to add that for because well, it, it's definitely going to have a little bit like Jordan talked about. So as that grape, as the grape juice is coming over the skins in the white wine process, there is yeast in there, just not enough to make the process kind of get going. So they'll add some more there. Whereas like a red wine, you're going to have all that stuff kind of swimming together a lot. So there's a lot more yeast naturally there because you've got skins already there. They're sitting on that juice, so that they may, they may not have to add as much. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You guys have anything to add? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, since you brought up Canada, uh, what kind of grapes are used in like ice wine? You know what? I do not know. To be, to be honest with you, I'm not. I'm not. Like, since we don't have an ice wine, very I'm not cold as ones. educated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as educated about ice wine, so that that's not a question that, like I said, I, I don't know everything. Since we don't have an ice wine, I haven't done a, di a deep dive in there. A lot of wine grown in Canada, New York, a lot of regions that you did not see on that map are not your basic cool varietal Chardonnay. They're 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 hybrid grapes that um, if you took a Chardonnay or even um, grapes that uh, varietal types that we have never heard that that's where they originate and they grow. Um, but when it comes to ice wine, um, a lot of it is different um, hybrids from the region. Um, is it true that what most people refer to as a champagne is actually a misnomer because it, they mean to say sparkling, but champagne is like a certain region? Yeah. Champagne, region. actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. so, 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 just great, great, great question. So, I mean, I, I meant to touch on it. We were back on sparkling. So, so a sparkling wine. So, if it's called a champagne, it has to be from champ the Champagne region in France. That is that is why that's the only place you can do that. If you were a brand after 1972, 72 or 75. I'm sorry. The, the, so if, if you if you were calling your brand a champagne before night, just call it 1975. Okay. Before 1975, like we did with Andre, you can call it a champagne because well, you have the label at California champagne. Yeah, but you but you can still use that champagne nomenclature on there because we were grandfathered in. But after, and I think it's either 72 or 75, so I apologize. After that, they they changed the the, the world while, while, uh, sparkling laws basically for the you know, the folks that kind of make all those decisions. Um, and so after that, it has to be called a sparkling wine if, if you are not from the Champagne region of France. So when you see something that says champagne, it's probably 40, 50 dollars. Then you know that, that that's where it came from. Any questions? Um, just kind of like touching on that, I heard it had something to do with like the Treaty of Versailles, since we were the ones who like created it, and we ended up not signing it, and that oh. was actually in there, because I, I went to my the, sommelier. The, okay. I oh, like, yeah, yeah. I just heard the French made snooty, and they were just like, no, <laughs> <laughs> no champagne. No, actually, I was going with him, because the French are very protective of their, they're very, they have probably the, you know, the toughest wine laws, because they are very protective of, of the wine and the history and everything that comes from them. Yeah, so they're very protective. They are very protective of of the wine and the history and everything that comes from them. Yeah. So um, I'm not I'm not sure if there's a connection that there may be. I'm just not. I'm well, not that, that was just like what I learned at my exam. Oh, well then you, you, know what, you took an exam on it. I would totally. <laughs> <laughs> You've gotten yeah, taken that test. But Anybody a lot of sparkling wine again, depending on where it's grown. Um, sparkling wine in Italy is called prosecco. Mm -hmm. uh, the main sparkling wine. The sparkling wine from um, Italy is called prosecco. Mm -hmm. 
Did I say Italy? I did, okay. And then Spain. Sorry. Anybody else? Well, yeah, it gets to a lot of legal, a lot of... Yes, the, the wine laws can be, and, can be uh, just overwhelming, depending on what, 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 what country you're looking at. I mean, we have our own laws in the U.S. Uh, every, every other country has their wine laws as well. So. Yeah, that was like the one section I didn't realize was going to be on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so we got there, they started talking about it. I was like, mm, what? Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So now we'll kind of get into, so I've given you enough uh, wine knowledge to be dangerous. Uh, so you can go and impress your friends and your family. So when you're all out to kind of do some stuff, you can make some pronunciations. You can talk about how things taste. Uh, next, we're going to kind of talk about, uh, you know, social etiquette in a business setting. So I know you guys are getting ready to go to spring break so that you can take some of the stuff that you get from this and kind of apply that to kind of your consumption, uh, consumption in the next little bit here. Uh, but you can also take this as being mostly juniors and seniors as you're going into those interviews. Uh, so you're going to be interviewing, yes, you know, and the current resources are here in Bidgood. Uh, but you'll also may have the opportunities to have, um, you know I, know, I know that we do, we have information sessions where we have wine there. Uh, so we have wine and food, I mean, that's our product, so we want to make sure that you're, you know, that you're getting to know it. But other companies as well will have you either in you know, a fine dining type of establishment, or you may have, you may have a meet and greet at a, you know, a bar or something like that. So just some tips and tricks just to make sure that you guys are being, on your, you know, being, being your best self in front of those future employers. And making sure you're not taking pictures of spring break. So, uh, so yeah, so, so just think about this as you're in an interview in a social setting. So the do's and the don'ts. Um, so as you're going into these social settings, um, everyone's going to try to make you feel, you know, you're very comfortable. I'm just using us as an example. We, we want everyone to feel comfortable when, when, when they come to see us. So, um, so just to remember that you're always on. I put that on there. Keep calm and be always, be remembering we're always watching you. So when you enter these situations, you are always on. Regardless of how casual it may feel, how nice everyone may be, everyone's looking. So this is, this is, a, this is an interview situation. So be aware of who you're talking to. So if you were to walk up to me and talk to me like I was your sister and you know, talk about things that maybe your sisters talk about that maybe you know, future employers and future employees should not talk about, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta curtail that, that conversation. So you know, you're not gonna talk to a future employer the way you would your mom, your sister, your brother, things like that. So just keep that in mind because that's a reflection of you and this is, this is the time where you're actually you know, wanting to be at your best. Who's the judge? Um, you're being judged for what you say how you say it, the eye contact, the body language. So if someone's talking to you and you're kind of looking away and doing stuff or you're like this and you're know, always crossed in all different ways, that's going to give off that body language. They're going to be like, maybe they don't want to be here. So just remember that, just to be your best self. And just, it, it, you may feel like you're in a fishbowl, but it's only a short period of time that you're in that fishbowl and you are in a fishbowl. Um, and when you're on, when you're speaking to someone, you are on. Um, if you come, like for instance for us, we have a regional recruiting conference, and it is a it's a you know, it's a full day and to spend the night. We have the very in the morning we have interviews and we have presentations. Uh, you're going out to our distributors. You're coming back in. You're on the whole time, so you're interacting with our people along the way. So everyone you meet and knows that you are here for an interview. We also have a social setting that night as well. You're on as well. Everyone's looking, seeing, to you, kind of understanding how you act in those situations. Because well, we, we've seen how you act in that formal, everyone's sitting there you know, in an interview situation, but we want to see how you interact with us on a, in a social setting as well. So I'm sure we're not alone. I'm sure a lot of companies have that type of set, set up. So just be, be aware that it, it's a 36 hour interview. Um, so, I don't want to So spirits in a business setting. So. So, now we're talking. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, now he's now he's going to come to us. Okay. So, so when you, you're sitting down at the table, uh, the, the server the server comes and says, "Okay, you know, may, may I take your order?" Do you tell him or him or her, "Hey, I'd like a drink," or do you say, "I'd like a cocktail"? If if you're ordering, it's something that has alcohol in it. Cocktail. It's my cocktail. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. So yes, yeah, so a drink is a liquid that can be swallowed. So I all want a drink. You know, that could be lemonade, that could be water, it could be milk. You know, it could be anything. But if you say I want to order a cocktail, that is a signal to that server that hey, I want I want an alcoholic beverage that has a mixture with it, and that's basically what it's on. It says you know, if you want a wine, I would say wine or beer, but a cocktail means I would like an alcoholic, a liquor beverage with a, a mixture. Um, one washout is two. We say two and two and one. Keep it clean. 
If you're on a, if you're on this side, you know, outside the spring break atmosphere, obviously, if you are on a an interview type situation, you're not going to order a long ionized tea that has seven different liquors in it. That is not a good smart decision. So keep it clean. A gin and tonic, you know, a, 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 co a coke and ginger, yeah, you know, a, a coke and a, a coke and a rum and coke, whatever it may be. So so just keep it clean. Again, this you're only there for a short period of time. If it's not something that you if you normally drink long ionized teas, maybe do that when you get home later. Yes, sir. So, also, if you don't, if you're with somebody and they're ordering something you've never had, stick to what you know. Yeah, exactly. If you if you don't drink vodka, don't all of a sudden start deciding that a business meeting or interview is going to be the place to pick up that spirit. <laughs> you know, if you are a Malibu and Coke drinker, drink a Malibu and Coke. Um, you know, I've seen too many times people, their boss or somebody's like, yeah, let me get a vodka straight with a twist. And all of a sudden, he's trying a vodka straight with a twist, and they're on the dance floor like 30 minutes later. <laughs> so you, you, you laugh. We all that know happened. that friend. Um, you know, also, keep it, like she said, simple. You don't have to have gin and tonics, but don't get something that you have to have something like a book to make. Exactly. Um, and like, nothing that includes the word bomb in it. <laughs> Your boss does not want to do Irish car bombs with you. <laughs> if he offers, fine, just fake it. But don't be the person that initiates shots ever, 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 ever. ever. <laughs> you guys laugh. I see it every single day. Yes, and remember, this is just in the interview. This is the interview. So this is when you are trying to be on your yeah. best behavior, best, best self. Or if you get the job and you're the new guy. Don't be the new guy that gets yeah. drunk the first time you guys have dinner. Exactly. Yes, ma'am. That's what I was going to ask. What if your boss buys you shots? Or fake it. Uh, Don't yeah, take I, it. I would Let him take it and then just kind of do the over the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. Because you got to remember, you know, it, and you know, it, I'll be completely honest. When we when we have our regional recruiting conference, we tell people, please do not try to keep up because. You know, we, we, you know, we're older. We're professionals. We are, we are professionals, you know, not, you know, in a, in a good sense. But, you know, we, we don't expect you to, you know, it, you're not going to get extra bounty points by, ha by, by sitting there, you know, toe-to-toe -to -toe with us, drink, you know, see who can drink who under the table. That's not how that works. Because your best impression is the one you want to leave. If you, if you leave it on the floor, it's not going to be good, right? Yeah, so, so you, you want to make sure that you're leaving that best impression and that you are on your, your best behavior. Um, so to keep it simple, you know, not just know what you keep, keep with what you know. Like you know, if you, like uh, Ryan was saying, if you are a normally a vodka tonic drinker, drink vodka tonic. Don't 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 get whatever crazy thing that whoever you're with may be. Stay with what you know and just and keep it simple. Do you know? A good rule of thumb is one drink per course you're being served. So oh sorry, well <laughs> just kidding. Okay okay sorry. <laughs> I haven't even seen the deck. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, so yeah, so we'll, we'll get to hold that thought right there. So any question on that? You know, again, this is this is the interview type situation. Obviously, a spring break situation, uh, maybe a little different. You're not going to be on on with your with your interviewer. Uh, but just remember, Facebook is all, Facebook, Twitter. You know, that's always always around. So just keep that in mind. That was my that was my mom's statement today. Um, so so the question is, what's the state? What is the standard drink in the U.S.? So when we say standard, because when people say uh, you know the legal limit or knowing your limits. Uh, sometimes people don't really understand what a what a unit of alcohol actually is when you cross over different areas. So, uh, so if you look, so a standard drink is equal to 14 grams of pure alcohol. So just kind of put it in a picture form for you. So that's a 12 ounce regular beer. That's a you know eight to nine ounces of malt liquor. That's a five ounce table of, of wine, five ounce glass of wine, or a, or a shot. So beer. So a can of beer, not a yard of beer. So if you get a yard of beer, spring breakers, you may be going. So remember, that is probably three to four different different units of alcohol. Just remember that. But I only had one. Exactly, exactly. But no, I only had one. No, but you had four in there. So just so when you're one in your mind. And, you know, and, a five, and talking about wine, a five ounce glass of wine. That's not the big wine glass that's this big, you put the whole bottle in it. That's not one glass of wine. That is multiple glasses of wine. So think about that. So a 750 bottle of wine has four to five servings of wine in it. So just think about that. So if you drank the bottle by yourself in the night, then just know. So, so, and then obviously, obviously everyone knows the shot is going to be that ounce. So just kind of, I wanted to put up there a picture form so that you can kind of visualize it. Because as we know, I've seen, you know, you go into bars and they have these, huge buckets of whatever with the four straws coming out that's that's not one drink that is going to be multiple that's going to be multiple 
10 drinks, if you want to call it that, in one deal. So just kind of keep that in your head, that just because it comes in one cup doesn't mean it's one serving. So, anybody have any questions? Everybody knows themselves better. I mean, you guys know what your limit is. You guys know, especially in a work setting, you guys know if, if wine gets you drunk, probably stay away from the wine. You know, go with the beer. If high grab beers, if you're at a brewery, like we had one at Lucid Breweries, if a 10% beer is gonna make you a little loopy, stay with 10% beer. And you guys know better than anybody what what your triggers are. Yeah. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Is it acceptable for women to drink beer in a Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I'm a beer drinker, so I can That puts you to the top of the interview list. <laughs> <laughs> you crack a PBR, you are up there. Absolutely. So, yeah. You're we get tired of wine. Yeah. We don't want to drink beer. No. So, yeah, I was a beer drinker long before I was a wine drinker. Yeah. All good. Any other questions? Nope. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, so just the, the one for one. So, this is a talk about hydration. I think Ryan was kind of touching on this. So, uh, just remember, as you are as you are walking through these different courses, like he was talking about, a cocktail at each course. So just remember, for each cocktail or each beer or each glass of wine that you have, drink a, drink a glass of water because you need to hydrate. Because just think about it: in that type of setting, you're nervous. You're nervous. Um, it's you're outside your comfort zone. You're worried about the words coming out of your mouth. You're worried about the questions that are being asked ask of you that time. So you're not necessarily paying attention to what your hands are doing and, 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 and what's going on in your mouth. You may kind of just be kind of focused on that person talking to you. So you have you have one one cocktail with, with the first course. You have a glass of wine with the second course. Oh, and then you have like you know an after dinner drink for the last course, and you've had no water. By the time you get to that dessert, it's not going to be real good coming out of your mouth by the time you're done. So just remember, if you, if you hydrate. That helps your body kind of, kind of, kind of uh, level everything off. If you don't hydrate, then then there's more alcohol than water going going through your system. Everybody understand that? Helps the next day too. Exactly. Um, and then uh, by my last public service, uh, my last public service uh, announcement is one and done. So just think about that. So obviously we talked about the courses, but um, if you are in a setting that's not a courses and it's it's more of a social setting, just have one. You don't, you don't need to prove anything to anybody. Uh, you're gonna be on your best behavior uh, and your best person is gonna be coming through. Uh, you, you can go and celebrate with them later on, but one and done is fine. And then, and then basically leave your best impression. Like I said, leave it, leave it with the people you're talking to, not on the floor. Because as you are and that nervous, that nervous energy kind of comes through, you may lose track as to how many you've had, but if you know you're only gonna have one, then you don't have to, you don't have to count, right? But if you have two or three, you will lose count and just stay in this watch out. You can't get the job on the first night, but you can 100% lose the job yep. on the first night. It takes one person that has a decision-making power to think that you are being inappropriate, and that is it. Yep. Yep. It's not worth it, not for a possible lifetime. Yeah, and you know, and quite honestly, companies put you in those atmospheres to see how you're going to react, to see how you're going to react, because the, you're, you're going to be either meeting new clients, we either be interacting with you know, potential customers down the line so they want to see what you're going to do in that situation so that when they hire you it's not a surprise as to how you're going to act so because they, they don't want you interfacing with their prospective clients and knowing that you are just going to you know just lose your mind and then make a horrible impression so then we get to the table part the table, very table part so i'm sure you guys have seen this in some of the restaurants that you frequent all the time so maybe not maybe not uh, so this, 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 this is what you this is what you may see um, at, a, at a pretty standard um, you know not 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 five star but this is going to be like your formal setting. So everyone knows. So, so does anyone know the rule of thumb about the uh, about the forks? Fork outside in. Exactly. So you work from the outside in. So think about this. If you sat down and you had two forks out here and a soup and a dinner knife, so you've got all these up here. So uh, the, the, the salad comes. You're like, okay, I got two forks. Which one do I pick? The one that's furthest away from the from the plate and work your way in. So then, and then a lot of times too, you use that fork, and then the server will take it away. So you don't have to think about it anymore. So you know that, that last fork is left for your dinner. Uh, your bread plate is going to be up on the left hand side. Uh, so uh, so you'll have that. You'll have your dessert fork and spoon at the very top of your plate, and then over on the side you'll typically have two glasses. You may just have one water glass. Uh, but some restaurants will go ahead and put one uh, one wine glass on there too. Just know that the top one is always the water, and the one below it is the wine. So does as it? And Jordan's gonna love this. So does anyone as anyone know a tip and trick? So so this is great and all when you're sitting at a square table. What happens when you're sitting at a round table and you've got 
plates, and you, know, you get all kind of stuff, and it all kind of looks together. And everyone kind of, and this happens in our, so everyone kind of sits down and looks at each other like, who's going to start? Sit first and stake your claim. Yeah, well, this exactly, is. but, but, but you know, like, you, you look, and you're like, there's a bread plate there, and there's a bread plate there. <laughs> who's going to start? Because you know if someone starts, you can kind of figure it out, right? So if no one starts, does anybody know the, tri the, the, the tip and trick to kind of figure out which one's yours? Yes, 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 very good. So this has been my new my new favorite thing in the world. So yeah, so you, you may look funny and you can hide it, but yeah, Dorothy was talking. So I'll do it like this. So you've got this and this. So what it, what letter does this look like? A B. And what letter does this look like? A B. Hmm. What am I hearing? I've got bread here and then I've got drink here. So as you're sitting there, you can kinda you can do it nonchalantly like Dorothy was doing it earlier today, like this. Or you can tell everybody what you're doing, like I do. Um, so, so you can look and see, and everyone else can know too. So everyone, you know that that bread plate right up to your left hand side, that's yours, and you can go ahead and, and go ahead and put your roll there. Because a lot of times everyone kind of knows the look. You see everybody looking around, like who's going to go first? But you'll be able to know. And then your drink is obviously going to be your water or your wine glasses. So just a little fun tip and trick. You can take it to all your friends. Good party trick. Next time you're at El Rincon, you guys will be <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. It is. I, so then, so then, so, so, so this is this was phase one, right? And then, this is phase two. So this is a really fancy dinner table, right? So this is when, uh, this is when you're, you know, you are on the last interview. You are. This is your interview to get. This is your job to get. So basically, it just kind of steps up the game a little bit. You got a little bit extra stuff on the table. So. The additions from the, the slide before, you may have a napkin here, it may be here, it may be on the plate itself. And so, first question, when you sit down and the napkin's there, where do you put the napkin? Your lap. Thank you. Thank you. Napkin goes in your lap. That was another moment. Where do people use <laughs> Where else would they put it? <laughs> oh, no, you, you said everything. Just, I'm just telling, yes, sir. Um, so how do you know when to go ahead and remove the napkin and put it in your lap, or when the server will do it for you? Ooh, good. Um, you know what? I, you know, I typically the server's pretty quick if they're going to do that for you. They'll when they see you, they'll come around and do that. Um, I would, you know, if, if if they are not there, but in the next few minutes when you sit down, I would definitely just put it in there. I, I'm always a lapper unless someone's standing there with me to kind of do it for me. I'll put it in my lap just as as a, a habit. And guys, if you want to be really bougie, if you're wearing dark pants, you can always ask for a dark napkin. So if they have white napkins, I'm not about to get my pants all linted up. You can ask for a dark napkin, and they usually will give you one. Fancy you'll impress the people next to you. <laughs> or you'll look like a snob, but either way, you'll have, have length on your pants. <laughs> um, so, so you see the forks the same, the bread's the same. Um, so this one, you know, and a lot of times too, you also may have, you may have a different number of plates, and we can talk about that. So you may have a, you may have a charger. Anybody know what the charger is? Basically, it's like a plate that does. It's a big plate that's not you don't eat off of. It's, it's decorative. Um, you may have a dinner plate, and then you may have a salad plate. So a lot of times, you know, you may have nothing there. You may have it already plated. Um, you, so, so just just know that the one on top is the, is the salad. Typically, they'll they'll take that dinner plate away and just give you the salad. And then as you eat things, the the, the, the plates will go down. So you'll know the last one there is going to be the dinner plate. So anybody ever? Oh, sorry, seen that? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, let's see. Oh, and then the water, the water and the wine glasses. So, so the last, the last one only showed um, three or two wine glasses, right? <coughs> so this one's going to show th uh, two wine glasses and then a water glass. If you've ever been to one of our dinners, we could have four, five, six wine glasses and then a water glass because it will, we, we typically will have different wines to, to pair with each course. So you're like, where do I start? So typically, the white wine glass, it's, you'll have the water glass at, the, at 12 o'clock, right? It's always going to be at 12 o'clock. So then as they come around, the white, the white wine glass is going to be the one that's the lowest, and it'll go up in, to the red glasses, or it'll go from the heaviest white to, or sorry, the lightest white to the heaviest white. So it'll kind of make that arc. So just remember, if you have multiple wine glasses, the one at the very base is going to be the lightest or the white, um, and then it'll go into the heavier white or red, just for a little if you go to a dinner that's a four wine glass to one water glass ratio, it's going to be a great dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, last but not least, um, the cup and saucer. Typically, oh, sorry. typically, this is not there until you have dessert. So they'll bring this out typically when you have dessert. Uh, but because that won't be there when you initially sit down, if you have a cocktail, that's a perfect place to put it. If you walked in from the bar, um, you had, you had, you know, you walked in the bar, you're sitting down for dinner, 
that's a perfect place as the, you know, the Emily Post way is to put your cocktail right there, and just at the, at the base of those wine glasses. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. That's why we can't have nice stuff. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, so any questions on like, you know, the do's and don'ts being in a social setting, kind of like just kind of watching out? Yes, sir. So what if you are at that dinner where there's two or three or four wine glasses, but you're like, I don't need to drink all of that. Like, you don't have just to. Just leave it there? Yep, yeah, yeah, you don't have to. Yeah, you, you don't, just because it's on the table doesn't mean you have to eat it or drink it. Mm -hmm. um, you may want to just try it just to be nice because you know, they always say you know, to try everything at least once. So try it. If it's not something you like, you can feel free to leave it there. So yeah, do, do not feel like just because it's on the table that you need to, you need to consume. Most of the time, they're going to be assigned pours for stuff that was already pre-purchased for the dinner. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, so, so Lindsay had a question that she kind of wanted us to kind of touch on, like, what's in the cost of a bottle? So, what is it that makes a bottle price what it is? So, there's a lot of different factors, and then this is only a few of them. There's a lot more than just this, but you know, in the, in the interest of time. So, first is the grapes. The grapes, you know, the grape cost. And that grape cost can be determined as to where it's grown. So you're paying for just the just the tonnage of grapes, and that varies on you know, the, the quality of the grapes, where they're grown, the type of grapes. There's lots of different variables that go go into that, but that's one of the factors. And then, like we talked about before, in the aging process, uh, so are, you know, is it is it aged in barrels, which can be very expensive, and we'll go into in a second, or is it is it in, in big stainless steel tanks, because the cost of that is go, is going to be popped out through every each bottle. And then the bottle itself. So glasses, glasses can be, you know, not the cheapest mode to produce things in. You know, cans are pretty cheap, uh, but but most of our wines in glasses. So, so that goes into there as well. And then the kind of the soft stuff that you don't necessarily see, uh, the sales and marketing that go behind the brand. So our brands are, you know, they have stories, they have a point of sale, they have all kinds of different things that go in that make you, they kind of talk to you when you're in the store. You don't see all that stuff. So sales and marketing, you have to pay people to do that stuff. You have to pay advertising. You have to pay for all those costs, and that stuff is built into all that as well. And we'll come, we'll come. I'll get you some examples. So for instance, I talked about you know just the just the um, the grapes themselves. So I kind of put a little thing in here talking about vineyard land values in California. So everyone's familiar with Napa and Sonoma, right? Heard of those? Well, if you look at those, so if you, highest price per acre. So in Napa Valley, California, if you bought an acre of land, three hundred thousand dollars just for the land itself. Forget about growing anything on it, just to buy the, the land that you're standing on. Uh, you go down to Sonoma County, get a little deal there, one twenty-five. Um, you go down to to the to San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties, it's a little cheaper there, right? So fifty-seven thousand dollars for an acre, and then you look at Monterey at thirty-eight thousand. So just think about you know you know, wineries; they buy ten, you know, hundreds of different acres of land. So just think about that: one acre at three hundred thousand uh, dollars. Just think of that Cabernet is probably be very expensive. So, you know, so you're, you're, if you're growing grapes, it's going to cost that much more. So just think about that. And then I found this online that I thought was kind of cool. So for a twenty-eight dollar bottle of wine, so uh, just, just kind of break it down as to what goes in there. So high quality Napa Hillside Cabernet grapes are $8,000 a ton. That's a lot. Uh, $8,000 a ton, so that, that kind of extrapolates out to $13 for, for this bottle, so based on, on, the, on, that, on, that, um, on that delivery. And then you have to add an extra long, so the cork, I didn't mention that before, cork goes into most wine bottles. That's, a, that's another $2. Uh, you got you got the bottle itself. That's a dollar. You got to print the label that goes on top of that. Uh, goes on that wine bottle. That's a dollar. And then you got to get the machinery to fill the bottle. So that's called another dollar. And then the oak barrels. So for the, so if you extrapolate it out, it'd be ten bucks for the, to to go into this price. But an oak barrel can be three thousand dollars. One barrel, three thousand dollars. So if you look at all these different wineries and you see tons and tons of barrels. Just think about cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. So, that, so that's why, you know, if, if we're aging more in wine in uh, wine barrels, then you can expect to have a higher cost on the, on the till end. If you are if you are aging in a big stainless steel vat, it's going to be a little bit less expensive because you're able to get more bottles out of that vat that's in there without having to pay as much as three thousand dollars for this much. Are they able to reuse their barrels, or does it kind of yes. weaken the flow? 
Um, you know, it, do, it does weaken the flavors, but that, some people like that. So depending on what the winemaker wants to do, it's kind of, it's kind of like a painting. If the winemaker wants some barrels, if, if, if you want certain flavors, those are going to be stronger in new barrels versus older barrels. And also with the growth of bourbon, bourbon producers have started buying a lot of, well, especially um, sherry barrels, mm -hmm. Cabernet barrels. I'm sure you've seen like Russell's Reserve has an aged Zinfandel cask, aged in Cabernet cask, so they've started to be able to pair a lot more with bourbon producers to marry the two together and kind of help some of the cost. Yeah, and then we've actually done the flip side and we've tried to do wine and whiskey barrels. So yeah. everyone, everyone's playing nice because the barrels are cross pollinated So any questions on this so far? This is just an example that's kind of give you an idea for $28. If that, that bottle is $28, it's kind of what went into what went into get it to the $28. Just to give you all an idea, like 300,000 an acre, the quad is 22 acres. So think of $300,000 for basically 1 22nd of the quad. Just to give you an idea, of, and that's just yeah. for dirt, like literally nothing's on just it. Just dirt, yeah. yeah. That, that's before you plant, that's before you add machinery to, 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 to plant the, to plant the, the stakes. Yeah. That's before you even open the door, that's just basically walking on the land. Yes, sir. Uh, how much do you think, uh, one age extra storage gets up to the bottom. I'm sorry, the one like, like an extra age of, yes. of like what's the difference of something that you're gonna put like brand new is only gonna be aged like six months or something that's gonna age for six years. Um you know what because that barrel can't be used and you have to store it, so that's gonna add to it because you think about all just the hard cost, and then you've got warehousing, you've got rotation, because you can't let that barrel sit there, you gotta have somebody kinda like moving that stuff around so it so that it's not you know, so it's moving at all its costs. You've got somebody keeping track of it. So just those costs alone are going to add to that. Um, so you'll see, that's when you see like you know, 12 year, 30 year, 40 year type stuff, whether it be whiskey or wine, uh, you're going to see that that be more expensive because you've had to keep up with it. And you're also paying for rarity. I mean, something that yeah. is 12 years old is going to be probably produced more than something that you let sit for 16 or 18 or 25 years. Um, so you, you barrel for that kind of growth. But if you're bourbon right now, you have that kind of growth. So there's definitely a gap, and there's just not a lot of 18 or 25 year yeah. scotch out there. And the same thing with wine, too. Yeah, these are hard costs, but if a wine gets really popular like that, it's all about supply and demand. That cost can go up real quick overnight and have nothing to do with anything we just talked about. So, yeah. uh, so you got the perceived value, and then you got the actual value. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, also, too, we, for, you know, this, we, have, we talked about a three tier system. So we are we are a winery. And, uh, I'm back real quick. Um, so a three tier system in our in the federal government after prohibition set up the three tier system, basically saying a winery or supplier of alcohol has to go through a distributor, a middleman to get to a retailer, and then obviously to you. So if you see we're Gallo, we're, we're the winery, we're the supplier, going through the distributor and the retailer and then to the consumer. Well, in between there, there are taxes. So we're we're going to sell it to the distributor. Oh, okay. Well, there's there's that money that that goes on top of that cost. That distributor then in turn sell it to the retailer. Oh, there's another cost that's tacked onto there, and that retailer's gonna, gonna sell it to you. And oh, guess what? There's a tax on that too. So that alone is gonna make the cost of your wine go up. And that had, not just for ours. That's every every product. So just to kind of keep that in mind, and it's been it's been uh, it's been taxed and sold a few times before you actually buy it in the stores. And then. I think that's it. But is there any other questions? That I know because I'm like, well, we're running over time. Is there any other questions that we didn't touch on that you guys may have that we can try and answer for you in our little limited amount of knowledge? I'm sorry. Can you give us any tips on pairing wines? Pairing wines. Um, you know what? Pairing wines has actually changed a lot. And you guys can feel just free to jump in, um, Jordan and Ryan. You know, it used to be that you had to do red. You know, reds had to go with like heavy. But red had to go with the steak. A red had to go with something heavy, um, and a white wine went with fish or chicken. Um, but you can do a lot. You can either do comparing, uh, co compare a wine, a wine taste with wine foods, or you can do contrasting. So you could have something that's like really creamy and heavy with something, and then have a wine that's very acidic to kind of cut into that creaminess. So depending on what you're wanting to do, you can pair both. Um, and a lot of it's just trial and error. So even though you may think that these might not go together, I would totally suggest you try wines before you, you know, just kind of think they wouldn't go together because you'd be very surprised. Uh, kind of the old rules of, you know, uh, of wine pairing have gone out the window and it's kind of like just whatever you like. Yeah, I mean, what, what if you don't like Cabernets, you're not all of a sudden going to love a Cabernet because you're having a steak. Yeah, I exactly. hate Pinot Grigio. I think it's horrible. <laughs> I'm not going to all of a sudden like Pinot Grigio because I'm going to pair a fish with it. You know, if you like red wine and fish, hey, 
the world's your oyster. Yep. I mean, if it's really exactly. going to bother you, and you're at a social setting, it's got a nice place that would pair something, ask the server. Say, what would you recommend? I'm, I'm thinking about getting pork chop. What would you recommend? Because they're going to know, they've already done staff trains that, that wineries have done for them, and they're going to go, hey, that pork's going to go really well with this petite Syrah kind of thing. Don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, the, the, the servers know a lot, so I, I would definitely lean on them. Stay away from Pinot Grigio's. <laughs> <laughs> four, so four yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a different type of uh, wine glasses. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to hold, like, is there a proper way to hold on to the glass? I mean, depending on what kind of Pinky glass. out. <laughs> Always. <laughs> That's kind yes. of girly, though. That's, yeah. that's kind of girly. Nobody will judge you. I drink with my pinky out. Yeah, you know, if, if, you have a wine, if you have a wine glass that has a stem, the stem is a good way to hold it uh, because you don't want to, you don't, it's your hand, you have your hands, right? And your hands are warm, typically, right? So if you if you have a white wine and you're holding that, you're holding that, um, that glass, you're warming that white wine up. And white wine is to be, to be should be served chilled. Um, if you have a red wine, you, you know that that may and you kind of if you're, you're putting your, your warm hands around a red wine, it can still impart some flavors that may not be great as it warms up. So if you have a stem, always hold it by the stem. What if, what if you don't have a stem? Um, if you don't have, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you're doing, go ahead. I mean, I would, if you have a stem, I hold it. My hands are too big to hold a stem, so I hold like you have the little round part at the bottom. I just pinch the bottom hold it like that so I'm not, especially if I have a white, I'm not warming it up, so I'll just hold the pinch it. But if it's a, like a, yeah, if it's a stainless glass, stainless. I just hold it on the tips, yeah. and just so I don't I have a little bit of separation from the, I'm not palming it like a, like a baseball. Uh, yeah. So okay. just a little bit, and you have just a little bit of area, so you're just not sitting there warming your wine up the entire time. Anything you want to add? No, I agree. I mean, when you have the stainless wine glasses are kind of very popular right now, but like Ryan yeah. was saying, just... I mean, you don't have to hold you on your glass like it's a, a it's not going to jump out of your hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? So if you have like three or four different glasses of wine sitting in front of you, how do you decide which one to drink first? Or does it not matter? Um, you know, it, it, unless unless it's with a pairing or unless, unless you know, it's in a formal setting and so, you know, I'm not, there's different scenarios. It's a lot of times if they have that many glasses out in front of you, they typically have like Okay, they'll have a suggestion as to this one pairs well with this food and this course. You know, a lot of times it, they'll do that with a, a, a prepared menu. So you kind of will drink it with the course that it goes with. Uh, but there, if there's if there's no one, no kind of rule or anything there kind of telling you why, you can just kind of try it yourself. Um, traditionally in, in wine in wine tasting, we typically go from uh, white to red and light to heavy. So just like we showed you before, uh, the whites first and the reds. And then you can give your lighter whites to your heavier whites, and then your lighter reds to your heavier reds. <coughs> well, we totally, I mean, is there anything else that you want us, anything else we didn't cover? Kind of talk about the management training. Sure. Oh, okay. Anytime. 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 Just to kind of let you guys know what we're on campus recruiting for. Uh, we are recruiting folks to go into our management development program. So uh, this is a it's, a it's an entry level program. Uh, it's a full time position. So uh, after you graduate, uh, we're looking for folks to go into. It's a three phase program. We actually start you out in entry level sales. Uh, you're going to have an established territory of you know grocery accounts, and for us that are grocery and uh, retail accounts. Anywhere you can go and buy our wine off the shelf, like Publix or CVS, wherever you can buy wine and off the shelf, that's considered a retail establishment. You'll have an established territory of those retail accounts, and you'll learn about our products. You'll learn about you know, uh, you'll, you'll learn about industry, and you'll learn how to sell because we'll, we'll totally teach you that. And then we'll move you into a second phase, which is entry level management. And there you're going to have four to five to six sales reps who report to you. And your job is going to be get, to get results through those people. So you'll be training, developing, motivating all you know, those those people on your team to get sales results achieved. It's a great it's a great uh, great learning uh, position because you you may have young sales reps who just want to go 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 go. You may have sales reps who've been there 20, 25 years and have a lot more wine knowledge than you at 22, 23. Um, but you have to learn how to motivate your whole team, so you, you get a, little, a really good experience in kind of learning how to manage people. <coughs> and then from there, you would come to work for us as a field marketing manager, and there you're a liaison between um, our headquarters in Modesto, California, and then the market that you're actually calling on. So uh, you'll be the local gal expert. People will be calling you in a market as opposed to calling the winery in Modesto. 
and then from there you have a really good uh, really good uh, foundation from what we for who we are and what we are products things like that and then you can kind of set your path wherever you want to go after that so we have like I've been in customer development and shopper marketing where shopper marketing kind of peeling back the, the consumer and learning how they shop and why they shop um, we have customer development, which is a, a which is where we have retail buyers who, who are in charge of wine. So you're selling to like I was with the Dollar General uh, folks uh, the other day. Um, the, the Dollar General folks they, they call them a Dollar General buyer. That one buyer affects six thousand stores with one yes. So it, that, if that buyer accepted one of our new products, that would be six thousand cases in every store like that. So you're you're talking to one person, but that can affect multiple accounts or across the, across your region across the country. Um, and you can do um, all, you can do spirits like like like, like Mr. Ryan Poor back there. So he all he all he worries about and talks about all day long is spirits. So he doesn't care about our wine. Buy New Amsterdam vodka. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, and so so that's his focus. He's, he's, he's diving deep into our spirits category. We have folks who dive deep in just to the uh, to the on-premise area where you're selling to restaurants and bars and hotels and airlines and cruise ships, places you can actually drink the product on premise. Um, we have, uh, sorry, trying to think who else. Uh, we have a direct to consumer. So you've ever been to an event and seen our barefooters. These are people who are out uh, interacting with our consumer on a daily basis. So you get there, they're talking to that consumer and getting feedback immediately and doing festivals, touring events. They have a wacky schedule. So but they're tons of fun. So there's a lot of different opportunities you can do once you get through the program, uh, and you can kind of pick that path, but you know, the, the program is what kind of teaches you about who we are in our business.